we have a new free book for Human Action Podcast listeners, Dr. Guido Holzman's How Inflation Destroys Civilization. Learn how inflation isn't only making us poorer, it's harming our culture, mental well-being, and the moral foundations of civilization itself. Get your free copy today at mises.org slash HAPod free. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Christian, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Well, Peter Klein, who is our resident expert on entrepreneurship, said that we should have you on to discuss your latest book, which is called Moonshots in the New Industrial Policy, and the subtitle is Questioning the Mission Economy, and you've got two co-authors, uh, or co-editors, I should say. So can you explain uh, the, the background of the book and you know the major project that you're undertaking here? Sure. So uh, since the financial crisis, we are in the Western world increasingly in a renaissance of industrial policy, broadly speaking, where you have mega projects and stimulus and, uh, you know, we're all Keynesians now, somebody put it that way. And that is the new macroeconomic reality that, that we're in. Um, and for each recession, the stimulus and the packages just grow bigger and bigger. And they are increasingly framed and marketed under the label of missions or moonshots, uh, large scale projects where politicians initiate what they say is a desirable change. Uh, and they then try to mobilize industry uh, in, in certain directions. Um, you know, Joe Biden's cancer moonshot put in place in 2022 would be one such contemporary example. In the European Union, we've had the EU Green Deal being rolled out over the entire continent over the past few years, um, inspired by a similar kind of logic. And, um, you know, we are trying to address this um, from a theoretical and an empirical point of view. And it seems we have to relearn a couple of quite basic lessons, I would say, in economics, but we do so in 17 different chapters written by, in total, 24 different scholars, professors from universities across the globe who take on uh, various approaches to, to this whole issue. So it's me, uh, it's Michael Stankula and Magnus Henriksen, two professors, scholars in uh, uh, in Sweden, who are editors of, of this book, and then others um, put in their contributions. Okay, great. So th this probably goes without saying, but just to make sure we're not losing anybody. So the idea being the moonshot, like in the United States context, of course, the, the Kennedy administration in the early 60s, he famously said, by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon, and that involved lots of uh, government spending. And then the the standard narrative is, oh, not only did it achieve the narrow, somewhat arbitrary objective of putting a human being, you know, jumped around on the moon for a little bit, and they, they all came back and let, left the U.S. flag there, but that it spun off all sorts of technical innovations, that, you know, the act of us doing that, you know, spawn all these things. And, hey, you couldn't ever trust the free market to do something like that because it wouldn't have been profitable for any one firm, you know, because there's all sorts of positive externalities, and that's why... You know, you want a government to come along and there, and there's something the proponents would say about an audacious program. So it's not just a general support for government R&D spending, but to call it a moonshot type approach in particular right. means pick some audacious goal that seems impossible because that will just bring forth the best from everybody. And you don't even know what people can accomplish until you really set a, a lofty goal. And let's, you know, and, and don't listen to the naysayers who say government is the problem Look at, you know, they, they did the moonshot, right? And so they can do all these other things. Like, let's try to cure cancer. Let's try to, you know, solve the, uh, the climate crisis and da, 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 da. So that's the, the narrative. And, and, my, and from reading your preface, 
I'm, I'm taking it and you and just hearing your remarks with you saying about the financial crisis that even though like we in the austral libertarian world can be cynical and think oh ever since you know the 1930s the profession has been against us actually there was a you know what might be called neoliberal but there was a a period towards where like there was a sort of consensus that yes broadly pro market deregulation tax cuts and whatever were the way to go and then with the financial crisis it's like everyone forgot all that and went back to top down central planning yes yes i think you uh, you summarized it neatly here now uh, at least in europe i think we learned the hard way from the 1970s and the 1980s of you know it was basically a prolonged crisis where we kept pouring money on industries which basically lacked um, competitiveness and uh, uh, that was you stopped the process of creative destruction from taking place and then in the 1990s in the 2000s that was altered uh, and, and you saw different policies which were more about enabling competition opening up markets enabling more free trade across the European continent. Um, and as you say, that came to an end with the financial crisis and by the, the reading and the understanding of the causes of the financial crisis, which were largely um, put on, uh, how to say, untamed neoliberalism is mm -hmm. how it, it has been interpreted, I would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, same thing here that, yes, it was blamed on, oh, there was deregulation and, you know, even Alan Greenspan admitted that, uh, you know, his faith, and I forget, I forget the exact phrase he, he used, but Greenspan said something that, you know, seemed to admit that, oh, yeah, my faith in free markets was too strong and the experience of the housing bubble has shown me the error of my, you know, something like that, that, and he's, he's allegedly the apostle of laissez-faire. Um, so that's certainly uh, w what happened. And we, and we, you know, in the Austrian camp here in the U.S., like Tom Woods had a book that came out right away called Meltdown that was showing how monetary policy broadly and then some very specific government programs that were explicitly designed to get banks to make home mortgages to people who otherwise wouldn't have qualified you know, it's like, well, take your pick. Which one is it? Are you saying the government, you know, got people into homes who otherwise wouldn't have? And they were all celebrating that when the housing bubble was was rising. And then when it collapsed, it was like, oh, my goodness, you know, capitalism's giving too many people these loans. So um, that that's the way, yeah, it played out here. Yeah. We, uh, we do discuss the financial crisis a bit in the introduction and in some of the summarizing chapters and uh, the reading of it from... You know how it was we learned partly the the wrong lesson in the western world uh, around that and uh, we forgot conveniently we forgot that it was these kind of mission oriented ideas that got us there actually in the first place where uh, fannie mae freddie mac were essentially they were instructed by congress to take on all the downside uh, related to these loans to minorities who were not able to pay for themselves. And when when you do that, you get uh, the situation of privatized profit and socialized loss. And there, the uh, economics notion of moral hazard, I think, comes in nicely, where, uh, you know, we see this a lot today, and, and I always say about it that um, no risk is too big and no project is too reckless if someone else is footing the bill. And uh, that was largely, I think, the, uh, uh, the reason why the financial sector and the real estate sector were so reckless in the financial crisis or, or that that paved the way for the financial crisis. Um, and the reason they were reckless is, well, you know, someone else was taking care of the downside. So they went for the upside. You get a black hole in the economy, which swallows more and more. And as long as things go well, it, the economy keeps growing and everybody says how competitive we are until it crashes. And then it's horrible. And uh, 
But that story, that story is not part of the, the overall narrative, I would say, mm. in Europe. And this is part of the problem. And that's why we are repeating the same kind of policies now under the label of mission-oriented innovation policies. Uh, I don't know if this is a fair question. Like, if, if you just don't have a, a direct response, that's fine. But because what I'm going to ask you is not directly pertaining to the topic of your book, but I just know with us going back and forth here, I'm reminded that the standard Keynesian narrative coming from guys like Paul Krugman in the years, let's say like 2010 through 2013 or 14, was they kept holding up the case of Europe and saying, see, austerity doesn't work. Those fools over in Europe you know, tried to balance their budgets and that's why their their GDP growth has been so awful and their unemployment is so high. And so thank goodness here in the United States, we had, you know, Ben Bernanke at the helm of the Fed and the Obama administration, they weren't perfect from a Keynesian perspective, but at least, you know, we had the QE programs under Bernanke ignoring idiots like Ron Paul and Obama, you know, the Obama administration running four years, a trillion dollar plus deficits. So, you know, thank goodness we didn't listen to those fiscal hawks who were warning us that, you know, hey, the private sector is tightening its belt, so does the government. No, it's precisely in a downturn, especially after financial crisis, when you want the central bank to open the floodgates and let the federal government run massive budget deficits to, uh, you know, boost aggregate demand. So, and they, again, they just thought, they kept pointing to the example of Europe to show oh, over in Europe, they tried to do, be fiscally conservative and that blew up in their faces. So how do you how do you feel about that narrative? Uh, you, it's very hard to analyze Europe um, with the same lens as you apply to the United States. The prolonged euro crisis after the financial crisis was largely one where certain countries had accumulated a lot of debt, and they were they they had no monetary policy of their own because that was centralized to the European Union. But at the same time, they had fiscal policy as a tool they could work with. And in that discrepancy um, and with a currency that would never correct itself to the need, so to say, of, of the particular country, uh, you ended up with this prolonged euro crisis in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So I think it's largely related to other factors. Okay, great. Um, so how do you want to proceed in terms of, you know, the, the, to summarize some of the takeaways from your collection? Like, mm -hmm. do, do you want to like focus on some of the theoretical objections and then some of the empirical or how do you want to I take mean, this? I, I can... You can share a little bit like how, how you can read the book. So again, you know, it's, it's more than 300 pages and each chapter is a contribution in itself from uh, a collection of scholars who have their own areas of expertise. So, uh, you know, I, I can summarize a bit and highlight some of the uh, areas yeah, that, sure thing. that we find are very interesting. So the first section uh, contains a collection of different theoretical perspectives upon the re the reemergence of uh, the mission economy or the moonshot ID or industrial policy programs, broadly speaking, and uh, one of those is written by a German professor named Jan Schnellenbach, and uh, he takes behavioral economics and applies it to policy and innovation policy and the political economy of these kind of efforts and. That, I think, is very worthwhile to read because the whole behavioral economics edifice has largely been uh, used in order to say uh, that markets don't work and they are unstable and they're full of greed and biases. But in some magic way, those biases will be corrected if the government is uh, in control. It's, it's sort of been the reading of the, the, the behavioral economics theory. So um, uh, Schnellenbach takes on that in, in a very uh, interesting way um, that I think is worth reading. Um, we have another theoretical chapter by uh, a, an associate professor of sociology uh, whose name is Olaf Hallonstein, and he, he writes about 
innovationism and the new public intellectuals. Now, innovationism, uh, he uses that term to say that belief in innovation as a cure it all for the Western world has become almost like a secular religion. Like uh, you go on a pilgrimage to Silicon Valley and uh, mm-hmm. you uh, uh, pled guilty of bureaucratic sins of large corporations. And, and you are to listen to uh, a prophet from Google and visit their temple or headquarter you know mm. it's it's a really a, it's an entertaining and Christian, just to make sure that people could, so he was saying innovation ism just to make sure yeah. everyone everyone caught that if they're driving and there was traffic so yeah go ahead yeah uh so uh i i personally find that to be very uh amusing um to to sort of understand why things are the way they are uh there's this over belief in innovation and that it will somehow emerge and cure us from from everything. Now, he also documents in this chapter how these new high priests of, of innovation are usually uh, academics who are uh, public intellectuals who are very well paid. They charge a lot uh, for their public appearances. Michael Porter would be one of those. Uh, Richard Florida is another one. And Mariana Matsukato would be the third one, which we are, you know, taking on more uh, in, in this book. So, uh, but then that is combined with some slightly more Austrian perspectives. Professor Randall Holcomb has a, a piece which he calls Engineering is Not Entrepreneurship. Um, and there are a couple of others. So, so first part of the book is collection of different theoretical perspectives upon this whole renaissance of industrial policy. And it seems like one of the themes there is that to, for people who are very technically savvy and, you know, wonkish and know certain things or, or maybe know a lot about various subjects, that doesn't necessarily mean they should have influence over the government picking winners and losers. Like, like the, no, those are separate realms and go ahead and let, let the capital markets decide, you know, which firm should get funded. Mm. Yes, um, I think that's a an important reading of it. And uh, underneath all this, there is a fair bit of political economy uh, kind of literature where, you know, we're going to see that in the next section, which deals with a couple of uh, empirical illustrations of how this is played out in, in the real world. But um, Largely, the whole political process is captured by various interest groups who then influence it and shape it to their own benefits. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, mm. okay, on that, do you have a a feeling like do you like your own personal model that you know someone who's from one of these companies or like a consultant who deals with a lot of and they're either testifying or they're writing briefs or whatever, uh, for political officials and they're recommending things, the government policies that definitely benefit, you know, their company or, you know, the, the company of their client, their clients and so forth. How, how cynical are you about that? Is it the sort of thing where, yeah, someone who, you know, they might be biased, but they, do they genuinely believe what they're saying? Like, no, this really would be good for for Sweden, if if the government funded the, these proposals, or like, do do they know full well that they're being, you know, just just a special interest? Uh, I mean, most people have a disdain for Machiavellian Machiavellian kind of thinking, um, where that is just too cynical. So, in my experience, people end up in in a state where their thoughts, beliefs, and actions are in harmony with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, self-interested biases, I think, are very, very common. Like, people believe what is right, generally speaking, is also what is good for them. Those two just happen to be the same all the time for us. Right, right, okay. So people are very good at rationalizing and you think 
they sleep soundly at night, genuinely believing that, yes, you know what, even though I, I want the government to give a subsidy to my company, that's because that's good. That's good for everybody. Yes. Okay. Everyone's special. <laughs> <laughs> Human Action Podcast listeners, you can enter in to win free attendance to an upcoming Mises Institute event. 2024 marks the 75th anniversary of Mises' great economic treatise, Human Action. And in honor of this occasion, the Mises Institute is holding a special conference on May 16th through the 18th. Scholars from around the world will be there, including Guido Holzman, Bob Murphy, Joe Salerno, Tom DiLorenzo, and more. Visit Mises.org slash HA Raffle to enter into a drawing for free admission to the event. If you're a student, scholarships are also available at mises.org slash HA24. Now back to the action. Okay, so do you, do you want to keep going through the, the contributions sure, in the book? Sure. Uh, the next uh, section of the book has a collection of empirical uh, uh, cases and uh, descriptions of how this actually works out in reality. And uh, some of those are complete disasters, which are, they are in a sense, case-based evidence. Uh, so it's hard to generalize from them, but you can look at the underlying mechanisms and, and try to understand them. So one of my favorite chapters is written by a, a Brazilian associate professor, Andre Alves, who wrote his PhD thesis on uh, a mission a large scale, huge initiative in Brazil to revitalize their shipping industry in mm. order to go for deep sea water dr uh, drilling for oil outside of the Brazilian coastline where they had discovered oil 7,000 meters under the sea level. Um, so this was, they referred to it as the moonshot of Brazil's economy in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the shipping industry there had died basically during the previous two, three decades. So they tried to revitalize something that did not exist. And when they did so, um, interest groups were going to have a say. Labor unions would say, all right, we can approve of all this, but if you choose non-domestic suppliers, you're going to have a bad time, just to let you know. Um, long story short, this results in the largest mass arrestation, mass arrest of, of government officials in the history of Brazil. Even President Lula went to jail for this. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really big scandal in, in Brazil, and it's a big disaster. Uh, but interestingly, um, now Lula is out from jail and he's a uh, president and he has hired, guess who? Mariana Mazzucato is, has been there advising him to go for missions as a way to revitalize the economy. So, you know, this whole idea is so attractive to politicians because they appear to be at the steering wheel of the economy and they can stand there and uh, be those agents of change, uh, addressing the large societal challenges that people genuinely care about. And again, politicians, of course, want to believe that this is possible. So, um, you know, it keeps happening over and over again. Um, so on that one, just to, if, to elaborate, they were, they, what the pro project was, was a massive shipbuilding initiative? Yes, and related to it was Petrobras, the state-owned oil company, and the ambition to uh, build up capabilities to do deep sea water drilling. And, and uh, that was what they were after. So uh, the, re the reason I just wanted to clarify, because that's somewhat ironic that in many other contexts, the interventionist argument is that left to its own devices, just relying on the profit and loss mechanism, private industry will develop petroleum resources too much. Like they don't take into account climate change. And so we need to have a carbon tax 
to make business not develop oil as much as it wants to. And yet you're saying in Brazil, they were saying, oh, private investment on its own would not fully exploit this huge oil deposit we just discovered offshore. Yes. So that's why we need the government to subsidize this because clearly we can't trust private entrepreneurs to go dig up oil and sell it to people. Yes. This is a, that's an amusing remark. That's a, that's a good observation. And uh, it seems like there's always a reason for government intervention. That there's always a justification uh -huh. they're looking for. Do you happen to know, if you don't, it's fine. Like, but on that one, like, did they try to come up with, like, in a lot of these, there is some ostensible market failure argument about why there's positive or negative externalities or, you know, network effects and things like, but with, with something like this, where it's like, oh, we should build more ships or we should go get the oil. What, what possible argument could there be unless just to, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand how yeah. could they even plausibly maintain yeah. that the market didn't have the right incentives. Um, they, they refer increasingly to it as system failure instead of market failure. Okay. It's an entire um, system of semi-loosely connected and interconnected actors where they're in a kind of collective action problem where no individual actor is willing to take on all the risk or enough risk for the uh, positive cumulative causation effects to, to get going. It's a kind of Keynesian argument if you think of it. Mm -hmm. mm. Can I ask you just, if we pause for a minute from going through the, the list, just what, what's your sense? Um, are, do you have an idea? Are the economists in the United States in general more market oriented than in other parts of the world? Or do you not? They have the frame of reference to, to speak to that. Um, this is a very good question. Um, the, the literature we are addressing with this book mm -hmm. is largely a European uh, body of literature. It's called Innovation Systems, Systems of Innovation, National Systems of Innovation, Technical Systems of Innovation, where the um, the ideas I described here, system failure, collective action, um, cumulative causation, and you need the government to push for this um, these forces to get into motion. Uh, these are well-established bodies of literature in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, and in Sweden with their own academic communities around them and they have emerged not in mainstream economics departments mm -hmm. and not in economic history either or in political science but in their own kind of little subfield of uh, innovation studies it's called or science and technology studies or so so <sighs> Many of those scholars, they are not trained as economists. They don't have the frame of reference of, of a mainstream economist. So mm -hmm. that they, they kind of brush it away. Um, and they're not trained in these other domains of, so, of the social sciences either. Um, this is largely a European construct. And it has been very influential in guiding uh, the European Union's policies over the past two decades, and especially these green deals and these mega projects, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sensation is that in the United States, there is literature on innovation and entrepreneurship is much more Kirsner and Schumpeter 1.0, if I put it that way. Right. Yeah. So that, I guess that dovetails with what, what I'm trying to say that in the U S it does seem like there's more of a, an acknowledgement that, Oh, Hey, there's this school of thought or this approach. Like the, the baseline would be a default for let the markets allocate resources. And Hey, there's all these specific situations where the market screws up and then there's a scope for government intervention, but they at least give a nod to the fact that, oh yeah, the default is let the market do it. And then you got to give me a reason why the government, but 
in other places, it seems like that's, that's, it's not even up to that level. It, the, the example I'll give you is I was interviewing a Misesian economist from Venezuela, you know, many years ago, like when the, you know, when inflation was really bad there. And they, mm -hmm. if you remember Christian, they had, you know, so they had massive price inflation and then they implemented price controls. So of course, all the food disappeared off the shelves and, you know, people, people were having to like cross the border to go get toilet paper. And it's like middle-class, it was terrible. And so I was interviewing this economist again. So he knew about, you know, he was an Austrian in the Misesian tradition working in Venezuela and I'm interviewing him just asking because the, the news reports were, were blaming it on speculators and, yeah. oh, there's corrupt military officials who are, you know, selling the toilet paper on the black market. Like that, that's why they were blaming, you know, there was corruption and that's why no goods were available, not the hyperinflation combined with price controls. And so I asked him, I said, at least the other economists in Venezuela, they know what's happening, right? And maybe they're just not saying it because they don't want to get in trouble. And he said, no, they don't know. <laughs> like, like, like he, he understood what it was. It was obvious to him, but, but he was, he was saying, no, that like, that, that's just, that was the state of even the economics profession in Venezuela at the time that they didn't understand that hyperinflation and price controls will cause shortages. So, mm. you know, whereas we teach that to freshmen, I mean, the, the, the freshmen yeah. might not remember yeah. it two weeks after the exam, but they did know it at one point. So, and here's something else that I think you have much more in the U S and in a, sort of a mainstream econ department, there is some sort of political economy point of view, mm -hmm. uh, which is lacking in this body of literature, which of course is much nicer for everybody because they're portrayed in this nice light and, and uh, you know, visionary and capable and altruist. That is the, the way they are being portrayed by, by the literature. Um, Notions of rent seeking, of regulatory capture, and crony capitalism are are not part of the analytical lens. So, in one chapter here, it's it's me and two fellow scholars. We have gone through the annual reports of three government agencies that are in charge of these kind of prod programs over eleven years. So it's in total, it's 33 annual reports. And we have looked in all these annual reports at how these agencies refer to evaluations of their activities. Mm -hmm. We show that 84% of the time, uh, they refer to evaluations in a way that is basically marketing of themselves. They're promoting themselves vis-a-vis -vis the, the government, uh, the public, uh, the government departments that they are part of. Um, so the self-interest governing um, the government bureaucracies, we we just point at it there and say, you know, this is what it, this is what they're doing. But that perspective is missing always here in this kind of literature. In in Europe, I think you have more of it in the United States. A better a deeper understanding, but still it's, it's an important thing to, to remember. Yes. Well, and I see even here, one of the chapters that you're a, a co-author on talks precisely about the importance of a, having a public choice perspective. And let me just say a statement and then you tell me if, if this is capturing what you're trying to get there. So the idea being, it's very naive to just uh, you know, to, on the one hand, to to uh, vilify or or critique market based actors, Human action and saying, podcast oh, well, they're just responding to what the shareholders want, and you can't expect private to business to Mises invest Institute for the long term or to, you know, to invest in a durable thing. Like they're only going to do something if it, if it helps treatise, their bottom line. Action. But and then on the flip side, to say, oh, so the therefore is we can trust political officials May 16th to fund the, the, the efficient around the you know, world programs or whatever. And, and it's not that they're going to respond to incentives Solerno, Tom like what will get more. curry me favor Visit with the labor Mises. unions or what will maximize my chance of re-election. But no, we can trust government officials to spend to tax dollars if you're a student, on those things are also that a group of experts tells them, you know, these, these are the investments in long-term R&D that will promote GDP growth or whatever. That, yes. You know, be, be consistent. And the same corporations 
that are then by these scholars. I mean, to a greater or lesser extent, they have a bit of truth in this, that these large corporations are at times um, not very good uh, you know, s- citizens of society or, or global citizens. And they point at their reckless, greedy, uh, corporate cronyism, etc. They're more than happy to criticize private corporations. But then they expect that these corporations will become nice and wonderful citizens of the world if the government uh, allocates a bunch of free money to do good social things, like in the financial crisis. This this asymmetry is mm-hmm. very striking when, when you look at the, the whole thinking behind those missions. Yeah. Yeah. And to, like to give two examples of things where, you know, and I, it could be that these particular examples are innocuous and there's nothing in the fair, but in the United States, um, you know, Exxon Mobil, you know, the giant oil company, you know, the, they were spending originally, they funded some things that would be considered like denier or, or, or skeptic science with respect to climate change. And then they changed their tune and they started funding things and they came out in support of a carbon tax. But they had like internally, they had made a bunch of investments in natural gas activities and, you know, and they had, they had built in the remodeling, assuming there was going to be a price put on carbon. So it was sort of, you know, it, if so for people at home, a modest carbon tax would give a huge advantage to natural gas because, you know, it would hurt coal um, it would be a little bit you know, better on oil because natural gas doesn't have that high of a, of a carbon mm-hmm. content and it's much more robust than, you know, wind and solar mm-hmm. for electricity generation. Mm-hmm. And so that, you know, is like, oh, they, so now they can come out as being responsible corporate citizens and have ads about, you know, we need to put a price on carbon and blah, blah, blah. And yet they had revamped their business model so that that would actually help them, you know, and so forth. Yes. And a different example, I think it was, I think it was Walmart when they had pushed through and they were they were raising the wages across the board for their employees that then they were agitating for like certain increases in the minimum in the in, you know like the government floor minimum wage. Yeah. You know what I mean? So once they did cuz then it was like, "Oh, so when, since we decided it, it makes sense for us to do it, let's go ahead and now you know not mm-hmm. let our competitors undercut us mm-hmm. by offering a low, you know, by paying lower wages, you know, that way." So anyway, just two examples of things where Mm. companies, you know, did something and then they were agitating for measures that would kind of basically force everybody else to go along with them. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is interesting. Um, the uh, the argument we bring forward in the book, and this is perhaps the most important insight, at least for me, that um, these large-scale programs and uh, uh, funds that are basically put there and made up for grabs for corporations um, are they create black holes in, in the economy because no risk is too big and no project is too reckless if someone else is paying for it. And that's the moral hazard of it. So it is not a functional way to create economic development. You create reckless, irresponsible corporations. And this is largely what fueled the financial crisis. But we never learned that lesson. We learned other lessons, um, which were only partially true, I would say. Mm. Uh, as we round this out here, so your, your part four is alternative paths. Do you want to speak to that section? Sure. can say a few words on it. So. Uh, some of these chapters say that, that you know it's it's not an entrepreneurial state it's an entrepreneurial society and what is that entrepreneurial society we have one contribution um going through the various pros and cons of r&d subsidies targeted grants versus deductions saying that to the extent that you want to increase uh, knowledge spillovers and and r&d supply in in any society it's better to do that via deductions than targeted 
money because that distorts competition. It ends up in large corporations and it tends not to be technology neutral, uh, going to information problems and economic calculation problems. So I think that's an important um, perspective to have in mind. But then, uh, I mean, getting economic and social development is about uh, making markets work in a better way. And there are so many government failures there uh, to be corrected. And that's what we're pointing at towards the end. So if you have a labor market that does not work properly, if you have an educational system which lacks both quality and relevance, then dealing with that is innovation policy rather than putting in place mega projects where politicians can inaugurate things. Okay, so fixing, like, in a nutshell then, rather than having the government spend massive amounts of money on particular research and development projects, maybe fix, fix the public schools so that they're cranking out people who know more math and science or something that are, are better educated? Oh, yeah. Now... At times, you make a distinction between horizontal policies and vertical policies. Mm -hmm. Vertical would be those that uh, specific industries benefit from, supposedly, and, and horizontal being broad, sweeping reforms that everybody would benefit from. Now, those are more difficult to enact, the horizontal ones, because the benefits are greater, but they are less visible uh, in the short run. And that visibility is very important if you're a politician. But nevertheless, that's, uh, I think, what we recommend. Okay, well, great. So my guest has been Christian Sandstrom. I, I see here, Christian, that uh, you're an associate professor, but also you're at the Ratio Institute. Can you explain what that is? It's a research institute in Stockholm, Sweden, which performs research on the conditions for enterprise and uh, quite often takes on more of a, I'd say a market process perspective upon things, more an evolutionary approach. Yeah. Okay, great. And so the book is Moonshots and the New Industrial Policy, Questioning the Mission Economy. Christian, thanks so much for your efforts in producing the book and for uh, joining us today to discuss it. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time check back next week for a new episode of the human action podcast in the meantime you can find more content like this on mises.org.